example. All right, Luke chapter 8 is where we're at. Last week, if you were with us, we, uh, we looked at three aspects of Jesus' faithfulness. We saw the faithfulness of Jesus to his promise uh, to bring the gospel to the whole world. <clears throat> we saw the faithfulness of Jesus to his people. We saw that um, he brings the gospel to the whole world to the least and, and, to, the, and to the last, that, um, that he went to the region, the Gadarenes, of people that by and large had walked away from God or had sought their own uh, way. He went uh, to the least and to the last in the sense that he went to the demonic, uh, the man who was filled with, with uh, d- demonic spirits. Um, Jesus was faithful. And thirdly, we saw the faithfulness of Jesus proclaimed as that demoniac, that man that, that had, had those demons cast out. Man, he, he was just faithful to proclaim uh, Jesus' faithfulness in his life, wanting to follow Jesus and Jesus exhorting him, go tell all your family, go tell all your friends what, what, what I've done for you. And so he was faithful to do that. And so we're going to continue with this, this theme of faith as we continue now uh, in Luke chapter 8. And today what we're going to be focusing on is our part in the faith process, uh, putting feet on our faith and, uh, and living out our faith. We're going to look at faith exercised today. We're going to look at faith exampled, and we're going to look at faith exalted. Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 40, and we read, so it was when Jesus returned from the region of the Gadarenes, where we saw last week, that the multitude welcomed him. So he's come back to the area now <coughs> of Capernaum, a multitude there waiting for him, and they welcomed him. It says, for they were all waiting for him. Uh, and behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue, and he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, uh, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. But as he went, as Jesus went with this man, um, the multitudes thronged him, just being pushed in by the multitudes. Same word, by the way, um, used there as when Jesus taught about the parable of the soils and that the seed is scattered and that the soil of the human heart receives the seed. And Jesus said some soil uh, is filled with thorns and it chokes out the word and the word becomes unfruitful. Same word for the, the, the crowded heart, the heart that has both the, the seed of the word of God and the thorns in it. That same crowding is the same word that's used when it talks about um, how uh, the multitudes thronged about Jesus. Um, And so, uh, where are we at? So, the multitudes there in verse 43, they, they, or 42, they thronged him. Verse 43, now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all of her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any of them. And Mark's gospel adds, not only uh, was she sick for 12 years, not only couldn't the physicians heal her, uh, but, you know, and not only have, had, they sp- had she spent all of her money uh, to, to seek the healing, but Mark's gospel adds that they, in fact, the physicians made her worse not better. So this gal was in a decidedly bad state. Um, And it says that this woman um, who who, who couldn't be healed, verse 44, came from behind and touched the border of Jesus's garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped, miraculously healed. Now we're going to dig into all of this, but you just need to understand here is that this woman came from behind because her condition made her ceremonially unclean, and she was not welcomed to to be really interacting with people in public. So just being a part of this crowd (coughs) was something that she really wasn't supposed to do, according uh, to Levitical law, um, according to their traditions, that if she touched anybody with having that flow of blood that she'd endured for 12 years, she would make them, just by, just by the physical contact with them, she would make them ceremonially unclean for a week as well. So she really, by all rights, according to their traditions, shouldn't have been allowed in that group. We'll look more at that uh, in just a minute. But here we are, we're, we're reading in the text, Jesus now returning from the region of the Gadarenes, 
Uh, and we find the multitudes. And again, you know, we're looking at faith and we're looking at faith exercised uh, here. And what do we do? We find the multitudes waiting for and welcoming him right there in verse 40. Both those words significant, waiting and welcoming. The word waiting in the Greek, it literally means to watch toward. It means to look for with an expectation. And the welcoming means that when you're watching and waiting and looking for with expectation, when the object of that which you're looking for and welcoming with expectation, welcoming means to receive heartily with joy. And and this is where the exercise of our faith begins. This is where it begins, that uh, we are to watch for Jesus. We are to look intentively, attentively for the Lord. We are to, to expect the Lord, and when we see the Lord, we are then to receive Him heartily with joy. Uh, in uh, several weeks, we'll get to Luke chapter 12, and there we will read this. Jesus said to his disciples, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, um, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him uh, immediately. So you have the waiting and then you have there the welcoming, the opening to him immediately. And Jesus said, blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat um, and will come and serve them. And so what we have here is we have this multitude waiting, watching, and welcoming the Lord. And among them, with them, we see the faith exercised, our first point here, faith exercised by a known leader and by a nameless woman. We have a man of power and prestige and prominence and position. We have a woman of pain and poverty and preclusion. She's been precluded from interaction with society. Now, immediately the focus turns to Jairus. Let's look at him. What do we learn about Jairus? We see here that he's a ruler of the synagogue. And understand, by the way, Jairus wasn't just one of many rulers of the synagogue. There were (coughs) many rulers, but he wasn't just one of the rulers. Uh, He was El Jefe. I mean, he was the guy that was in charge of admin, in charge of operations. He supervised the services. He supervised the elders. He coordinated the teachers. And so he was the big man on campus, large and in charge of the whole deal. And as such, clearly Jairus would have known who Jesus was before this incident. Like, he would have heard the reports, he would have seen with his own eyes the miracles that Jesus was performing. And as well, John's Gospel, John chapter 9, verse 22, tells us that at this time that the Sanhedrin had decided that anybody who had anything to do with Jesus was to be excommunicated. So him being the ruler of the synagogue, well, it would seem that he had steered clear of Jesus up until this point, whether it was his pride or his power or, or whether it was his position that kept him away, that, that blinded him <coughs> to his need for Jesus, whether it was peer pressure that put him in that position, whatever it was, hey, listen, all that's changed. It's all gone by the wayside. None of that matters anymore. Why? Because his little girl is dying. His little girl's dying. I have two little girls. They're, they're grown women. They have children of their own, but I st- forever see them as my little girls. I got four granddaughters. Forever see them as my little girls, you know? And, and you know, it's, it's, it's a funny thing, you know, as a guy when you get a daughter. Like, you know, you, you, you learn stuff. You learn about, you know, a, a, a massive amount of hormones. You, le- you, you learn, you're like, you hear yourself saying things like, why are you crying? And, you know... And, 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 you know, you've, you've never seen so much laundry in your life, you know. You, you, never, you, you know, the, the girl wears six outfits before dinner. Like, what's up with that? You know, you find yourself saying things like, get off the phone, and who's that boy? And, you know, all of the stuff that, that little girls, you know, are about. Sugar and spice and everything nice and all of that. My father-in-law used to say that little girls are amazing, and then they, when they get to be about 12 or 13 years old, they, they all get brain damage, right? You know? <laughs> and, um, but, but man, 
you know, all, for all the stuff that they put you through, I just, I, my heart hurts for Jairus, you know, because you, they're, you, they're always your baby girl, and, and here now you long for the day when, you know, she wore six outfits before dinner. All you know is your world is upside down. You, you'd trade anything. You'd walk through fire, whatever, man. Just heal my baby girl. This is what he's going through, you know? But listen, what we see here, and it's so amazing, and we really have to take note of it, this is not a distracted, unloving God who, who doesn't see, doesn't care, doesn't know. This is what we see here. It's, it's the sovereign providence of God at work that has allowed his little girl to have what she's got going on. This is God sovereignly. This is his, him providentially working. I like what J. Vernon McGee said. He said, providence is when the hand of God is in the glove of human events. And make no mistake about it, what we see here is God's hand in the glove of this event. We're all familiar with Romans 8, 28, aren't we as Christians? We know that all things work together for good to those that love God and are the called according uh, to his purpose, right? So, so we all comfort ourselves with that. Hey, listen, God's working all things together for good. And sometimes we mistake, you know, we say, oh, all things are good. No, some hideous things happen. They're not, all things aren't good. God promises, them, uh, promises to work them for our good. But we got to keep in mind, 10 verses before Romans 8, 28, we read this in Romans 8, 18. It's, Paul says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. That, that informs this whole thing, Romans 8, 28. In other words, God's going to be glorified in our lives. He's going to be glorified by what happens in our lives, by what he allows to happen in our life. And listen, God's hand is in the glove of this little girl's illness to reveal his glory. Certainly, his glory in raising her from the dead, spoiler alert, she's going to die, and Jesus is going to raise her from the dead. This is what we're going to see here today. And the Lord is going to be glorified in that. But also, listen, God wants to be glorified because he's going to use her illness in the life of her dad. He's going to use her illness in Jairus' life to bring Jairus closer to Jesus. It's been said that some people change by inspiration and others change by desperation. And what God has sovereignly done is he's brought Jairus to a place where he's desperate as only a dad with an only daughter can be. When she's nearing death, he's desperate. And so God, he uses this and, and allows Jairus to get to shaken up to where power, position, paycheck, nothing matters. The only thing that matters is I need Jesus. I know that he's the only one that can help. And see, that's what God does in our lives sometimes, is that we have to come to the place where we recognize that Jesus is our only hope. He's our only hope. And, and sometimes... What that means is that sovereignly is going to put you in a position where you're desperate. Maybe today you're here and you're desperate. You're going through a desperate scenario. You're going through a desperate circumstance. And listen, I would ask you to prayerfully consider that there is a loving God who may providentially have his hand in the glove of the events that's going on in your life. Why? Because you need, you need Jesus. And maybe he's rocking your world to bring you to the place where you're desperate. Listen, it's a good place to be. Because listen, whenever <clears throat> we get to that place, if we turn to Jesus, if we look to Jesus, if we, listen, by faith, what Jairus does here is by faith he comes to Jesus and what does he do? He puts it out there by faith and he says, Jesus, I'm desperate, I need you. Whenever we do that, listen, Jesus goes with us. That's what we see here in our text. What does Jesus do? He doesn't turn him away. He goes with him. Now hold that thought. As the focus now shifts to another person who's exercising their faith. Look at verse 43, back it up a little bit. A woman having a flow of blood for 12 years. She'd spent all of her livelihood on these physicians, right? All the money and you know, all the king's horses, all the king's men, couldn't put Humpty Dumpty together again. This is where she's at. <clears throat> so there she is. She's ostracized from community. She comes from behind. She touches the Lord's garment. She's exercising faith here. 
Mark's gospel tells us that what she said within her heart was this, that if I can just touch the hem of his robe, I know that I will be healed. Same expression of faith, Jairus coming. Mark's gospel tells us that Jairus said in his heart, my, if you could come, Jesus, and lay hands on my little girl, I know that she'll be saved. Same profession of faith. I know it, Lord. I just have this faith. And immediately, her flow of blood stops. She touches the, the hem of the Lord's robe, and it stopped. And Jesus says there, who touched me? And when all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and they press you and you say, who touched me? Like, who didn't touch you? That's a better question to ask. Like, they're all touching you, for crying out loud. <clears throat> but Jesus said, verse 46, somebody touched me for I perceived power going out from me. And now, verse 47, when the woman saw that she was not hidden... She came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he, Jesus said to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, what we have here, we have this parallel contrast in our story. <clears throat> You've got this child's crisis, Jairus interceding for the crisis of his child, right? She's, she's, she's had this crisis that comes on suddenly at 12 years of age. And par in this parallel situation, now you've got this woman who's bringing her crisis to the Lord, but it hasn't happened to her at 12 years of age. What's happened to this woman is that it's been going on for 12 years, both of them factoring 12 years in. And that number 12, it's used 187 places in the Bible, and it's a symbolic number. See, 12 is the number of perfection, and it's the number of authority. Um, I'll give you an example. When we were going through the book of Revelation, <clears throat> we read about the new Jerusalem, uh, which descends out of heaven, and it has 12 gates, 12 angels, 12 tribes, 12 foundations, 12 apostles. The city is 12,000 furlings. Uh, the wall is 144 cubits, which is 12 times 12. Each of the 12 gates has been named after one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so you see this perfection. You see this authority. And so the number 12 here, we've got this perfection and authority. And certainly we see the authority of Jesus here in Luke 8. We've been seeing it as we've gone through it. We saw his authority over uh, creation as he calmed the storm heading over to the region of the Gadarenes. We saw his authority over, over e evil and demons as he cast the demons out of the demoniac <clears throat> there in the region of, of Gadara. And <clears throat> we see now his authority over death and disease. So, so we see this authority, but we also see perfection. And, and where we get a really good glimpse of God's perfection in this account is the, perf is the perfect timing of the intersection of these two girls, of these two daughters, if you will. Jairus says, I got my 12-year-old daughter, Jesus, heal him. And now you've got this woman with this 12-year-long issue, and Jesus now touches her, she touching him by faith, and Jesus heals her, <clears throat> says to her daughter, calls her daughter as well, your faith has healed you. And so it's perfect timing what's going down here. Now, Jairus doesn't see this as perfect timing, I guarantee you that. The text doesn't tell us this, but I can just know, I mean, I get impatient at, a, at a, somebody cuts me off and I miss a light, you know? Oh, I could have made the light, but you're taking a nap there, and so now I didn't make that green light. You know, it was probably one of you guys, right? And I was like, ah! Oh! <laughs> but I get that way, but imagine Jairus, like he's like, Jesus, my daughter's dying, like help right now. And then all of a sudden, this chick shows up and he's like, hey, what are you doing? Like, you've been dealing with this 12 years. You can't put that off for an hour? Like, come on, right? Now, it doesn't tell us that that's what he's going through. But as a dad whose daughter is dying, I guarantee you that's what's going on. Gee, Jairus doesn't know it, 
But this is key, what's, what's going on here, what Jesus is doing and what he says to this woman and this interruption, the perfect timing of this interruption, it's the key to what he wants to do in Jairus. Notice what he says there in verse 48. Jesus says to her, daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. See, Jairus doesn't know it yet, but he's about to get the devastating news that his daughter has died. And before he gets that news, Jesus wants him to see the result of faith. So what we have here, secondly, is faith exampled. We have faith exampled. Jesus wanting to make an example of this woman's 12-year-long ordeal for this man with this 12-year-old daughter. And he says, I want you to see the result of what faith does, Jairus. And I want you to see it in the life of this woman. Now, <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11 is, is the, the, the great chapter on faith in the Bible. For time's sake, I won't have you turn there, but we read in Hebrews chapter 11 several examples of faith. We, it tells us there that by faith the worlds were framed. It tells us by faith that Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he didn't see death. It emphasizes that by faith, Noah was delivered from the flood. It tells us by faith, Abraham obeyed God. It tells us by faith, Sarah bore a child in her old age. It goes on to tell us about the faith of Jacob and Joseph and Moses and on and on and on. And Why does the Bible go to such great lengths to emphasize so many examples of faith in his word? Here's why. God wants to encourage you and me in our faith. He wants to encourage us in our faith. See, Hebrews 11.1 1 says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things not seen. In other words, just as our physical eyesight uh, is the sense <clears throat> that gives us the evidence of the material world around us, faith is, gives us that, that spiritual sense of the evidence of the invisible spiritual world that's all around us. It's been said that faith is like a radio. You know, you turn on a radio, and what happens? Music pours out. And the, the music, it isn't created inside the radio. The radio is just able to pick up on the transmissions that are filling this room. And in fact, those, transition, those, those, those transmissions, the radio picks up on it. They don't originate even in this room. They come from a far greater source outside of this room. And, and, and so the, it's exactly the same way with our faith, that faith doesn't originate within us. It comes from God's word as we receive his word, that far greater source, right? The Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And when this happens, the supernatural music pours out of us as the product of faith. And, and so this is exactly what Jesus is doing here now. This is why he allows this interruption. He brings healing to this woman, and in so doing, he's bringing hope to Jairus through, through the poured out product of this woman's faith. That's what he wants him to see. And, and so, so God is doing this work. Heals the woman, and listen, he wants to bring hope to Jairus. Now, there's a whole other message in these six verses that we could, we could dive into. I just want to focus on two things as it pertains to the larger lesson of faith. First of all, I want you to notice the contrast between these two people. Notice the contrast. You've got Jairus, who is a known leader. We know his name. He's large and in charge. He's a man of power and prestige and, and position, right? Lots of authority. In contrast, you've got this woman. We don't even know her name. She's a nameless woman. She, she's a woman of pain, of poverty, and of preclusion, been precluded from everything. We know, I've told you, she's, she's ceremonially unclean because of this issue of blood. According to Levitical law, that means, hey, listen, anybody who comes in contact with her is, is made ceremonially unclean for, for a week. So she can't in contact with anybody. That means, listen, she can't go to the temple. She, she can't enjoy just physical touch. I went and visited my mom and dad yesterday. What, what, what's one of the things you long for? When you see mom and dad, you want to hug. Just hugging my parents. She was precluded of just these basic things. Her, her kids, if she had any kids, they couldn't hug her. 
Her husband couldn't come into physical contact with her 12 years. So, so I mean, she couldn't cook for them. Some ladies are like, oh, praise the Lord. You know, my mom, yesterday, I'm like, Mom, we need to remodel your kitchen. She goes, my, in my world, a perfect house would have no kitchen, you know. Um, but, but, you know, it's, it, it's all of these, these wonderful things that make up just the human experience that this woman has, has been robbed of. So, and, and, you know, the bed that she would sleep on would be defiled, which means that if she were married, she's been sleeping alone for 12 years. You know, just this, it goes on and on and on. And so, so you've got this nameless woman and you've got this very powerful man and so on. But although they both come from such divergent backgrounds, some, such incredible differences between the two, listen, each of them has the same need for Jesus. That's one, one of the things we need to see. One of the takeaways. They, look, they both have the same need for Jesus. In and of themselves, they're both powerless. Now, it might have taken Jairus a little while to get that memo. It's a sudden onset. But now all of a sudden he realizes my power, my position, my paycheck, none of that matters. It's not going to save me. I'm not going to save my little girl. I'm powerless here. And it's just an illusion. So much of life is just an illusion where we think we're in control. And we're not in control. And Jesus is the one that, that, that we need. And we all have the same need for Jesus. I don't care how successful you are, how rich you are, how poor you are. We're all the same. And not only do they have the same need for Jesus, but listen to them, each of them needs to exercise the same faith to come to Jesus. They both need to exercise the same faith to come to Jesus. Listen, notice, secondly, I want you to see that, that the exercise of their faith, it requires a risk. Now, I'll say risk in air quotes because there's really no risk involved, but there is a perceived risk. And they both have some element of perceived risk. For this, for this man, for Jairus, What's he risking? He's risking his power, his position, and his paycheck. Hey, if you got anything to do with Jesus, you're out. You're ostracized. You're excommunicated. Right? So, so there's a risk to him to come to Jesus. For, for this woman, you know, she's risking public scorn and ridicule and so on because she doesn't belong in the crowd. She, did, she shouldn't be touching anybody. Right? Now, the, the fact is, the moment she touched Jesus, she didn't defile him. He healed her. Hear that. Some people, they're like, I can't go to church, lightning bolts will strike, I've done too much, I can't ask for forgiveness. No, no, you don't defile God. God heals you. You, you come in, in your, your worst state. You come as the train wreck you've made your, your life into. And the Lord, you reach out to him, you're the one that's transformed. He ain't taken aback by it, he isn't shocked by it, he isn't put off by it. He says, woman, your faith has, made, has healed you. Why, by the way, does, does Jesus demand, by, by the way, you know, you know the, the, the risk that's involved to this woman, you see it in verse 47, it's kind of articulate. It says, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, that she, became, she came trembling and falling down before him. What, what's all that about? It's about risk. It's about, I've, oh my gosh, I've been found out. And that's why she's trembling, you know? Now, why does Jesus call her out? Why doesn't he just continue on his way? Why does, I mean, he knows power went out from him. He knows she's healed. He could have just been, okay, she's done. One less thing, check. That, that's handled. Let me go. Now, why does he call her out? Several reasons. Number one, we've seen, he calls her out because he wants Jairus. He's got an object lesson here. Jairus, I want you to see what, what the result of faith is. But in this woman's life, listen, he calls her out, wants her to make this public declaration because it gives her an opportunity to glorify God with her life just through her testimony. He's given her an opportunity to share her testimony. Listen, God gives you opportunities all the time to share your testimony. And it's, it's your testimony that will bring God glory and honor and praise. So often we're afraid, you know, of, of you know, gosh... I don't want to share my faith. What if somebody asks me a question that I, that I can't answer? What if somebody becomes hostile to me as I'm going, you know, there? What if, you know, I just don't know if I'm strong enough in, in you know, my understanding of biblical doctrine to, to, no, no, no. The Bible just says, be ready to give a, a reason for, the, for an account of the hope that you have. I mean, we can all do that. Hey, look, I'll just tell you my story, man. Here's who I was, and I met Jesus, and here's what he's doing in my life. 
There's power in testimony. That's why, ladies, we're, we're focusing on this summer of testimony. There's power in testimony. And, and, and so, so it gives this gal an opportunity an op- just, just to glorify God through her testimony. Also, listen, it gives her an opportunity to grow in relationship with Jesus himself. Because, because she meets Jesus personally, intimately. Jesus having the, the occasion just to look her in the eye. Just to bring her comfort and encouragement. To bring her reassurance. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Like you're on the right track kind of thing. And so, so the Lord does call her out. Why? Because he wants to do these things. He wants, he wants her to be an example. He wants her to give her testimony to bring God glory and honor and praise. He wants her to grow in a relationship with the Lord and learn to trust him. But listen, it takes risk. It takes risk. And listen... The same way for you, application time, that it will require you, if you're going to exercise your faith, your, far, your part in the faith process, if you're going to exercise your faith, it's going to require you to take some risks. Now, truly, there's no risk, but there are perceived risks. Let me give you some examples. You know, the Bible says, talks about submission. It says, uh, wives are submit to their own husbands as unto the Lord says that we all are in places where we have to submit to those who are in authority over us. Listen, when you exercise submission, it requires faith on your part. There is a risk that's involved when you submit to somebody. Oh my gosh, if I submit to them, then, then maybe you know, they're going to want me to do something that I don't want to do. Well, yeah, that's the definition of submission. You know, I mean, I talk submission all the time. Sometimes, you know, I'll talk to couples, either in pre-marriage counseling or in marriage counseling. We get on the, this, the issue of submission. It's like, well, listen, I understand submission, but, but I just disagree with him on this point. Well, that's submission. Otherwise, you're just doing what you want to do, you know? And so there's an element of risk where it comes to uh, submission. There's an element of risk when the Bible says that we are to love one another as, as God in Christ Jesus has loved us. You know, the words agape, unconditional love. Doesn't matter how they're treating you, you're supposed to love them not as they deserve, but as God wants you to love them, you have to make an act of the will and choose to love them. Well, that takes risk. Because, because what, if, what, if, what if, you know, they continue to, to act in an unloving way? Well, they might. But it's not, it, it, what if the conditions don't change? They might not change. But we're called to, to love in that way. It requires risk on our part. We have to trust in the Lord that he's going to use those things. When, when God <clears throat> wants us to, to, to worship him in the giving of our finances. The Bible could not be more clear. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. We, we're to worship him in our giving. The way he set up the local church, it works by us giving of, the, of what he's given to us to see that the work of God is done. Now, God ain't broke. He, he don't need your money. If you don't want to give it, he says keep it. You know, that... I don't need your money, God would say. But here's the thing. He wants us to give to his work. That's the way he set it up. And it takes a risk on our part because what we struggle with is we go, oh, well, wait a minute. What if I don't have enough? And what God wants us to learn is, look, I'm going to take care of all of your needs. I'm going to provide for you. Sadly, it's true that for Christians, one of the last areas that really God gets surrendered from us is our finances. I know I had to deal with that. I grew up in a family, we, 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 uh, we lived in, in, in La Jolla, and my folks had money. And then we went through a season where we didn't have money. And it, went, it was a long season, and the formative years of, of, of my childhood were my parents not having money. And so I grew up with what's known as a scarcity mentality. And this was a mentality that I carried, and that was, if I give to you, there might not be enough for me. So, so I was very miserly with my stuff. And God had to break me of that and get me to the place to where, hey, look, don't trust in your stuff, trust in me. Just give and, and I'll take care of you. And, and, and so God had to break me of the pattern to where I said, 
oh, well, I'd, I'd love to give to the work of the Lord, but let me wait and see, you know, how the month is going to go. Am I going to have more month than money this year or this month or, or whatever? Let me figure out my finances. And the Lord's like, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take care of you. And if you give of your extra, it, it's not going to bring me glory and honor. And it's not going to do any sort of faith building work in your heart. To, to, to understand and to trust and to, to know that I'm going to provide all of your needs. And when God set me free from that and brought me to the place to where it was like, Lord, I'm going to give to you. I'm going to give to you. I don't know if I'm going to have enough to pay my bills, but I'm going to give to you as an act of worship because you've always cared for me. It, it, it grew me in my faith. But listen, it requires risk. When God tells you to forgive, listen, that requires risk on your part. You're like, well, I'm going to forgive? Even if God in Christ has forgiven me, but but wait a minute, what if what if they what if they're not really sorry? What if it's a risk? I love this statement. It rocked my world when I first heard it. The difference between where you are and where God wants you to be is the painful experience that you refuse to endure. The difference between where you are and where God wants you to be is the painful experience that you refuse to endure. Let me ask you a couple of questions. What faith risk is God calling you to take today? What faith risk is God calling you to take? What painful experience is keeping you from where God wants you to be? Listen, it takes a risk of faith for for these folks to, to, to exercise their faith. They gotta take this risk. Verse 49, it says, when he was still speaking, while he was still speaking, he's telling this gal, your your faith has made you well, go in peace. Someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house and they said to him, your daughter is dead, do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, do not be afraid, only believe and she will be made well. Well, in the Greek, what, what Jesus says here is he says, stop doubting and keep believing. Stop doubting, keep believing. Now listen, that makes a great plaque. It makes a great poster. Stop doubting, keep believing. I'll make that my Facebook status. Awesome. And that's where we want it to stay. We want it on the plaque. We want it on the Facebook quote. We don't want to live it out. But listen, where do we learn it? We learn it when we live it out. Stop doubting, keep believing. When the rent is due, when the lab results haven't come in yet and you're waiting for that, when the doctor report is out, when the pink slip has been given and we want to start doubting and, and the Lord would say, hey, no, 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 don't let this rock your faith. Stop doubting, keep believing. Jairus, you started off on the right track. You came to me and you said, I know that if you come to my daughter's house, she's going to be healed. And I'm coming to your daughter's house. Stop doubting. Keep believing. See, the psalmist said this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. How do you taste? You have to partake. That's the only way that you can taste. You've got to partake. And listen, partaking always comes down to faith. It always comes down to faith. And so Jesus says, hey, no, 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 stop doubting, keep believing. Verse 51, and when he came into the house, he permitted no one to go in except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the girl. Now, why didn't Jesus let anybody go in? It could have been because he he didn't want his identity revealed too soon, because if everybody saw that, you know, oh gosh, this is, this is the Messiah, then hey, we're going to try and, you know, take Jesus by force and make him, you know, be our Messiah who's going to, you know, kick Rome out and all of that. This is why Jesus often told people, hey, be quiet about what I did. Don't go tell anybody. And so many people wouldn't listen to him. Ah, guess what Jesus did for me? He healed me, you know, kind of thing. Could have been that. Here's the bigger reason, I think, because they were unbelieving. Because they're unbelieving. He's like, you're not going to get to see me operate and work. you got unbelieving hearts. And we're going to see that played out here. So he only allows, you know, Peter, James, and John's and his closest disciples, and he allows his mom and dad in. Verse 52, it says, Now all wept and mourned for her, but he said, Do not weep. She's not dead, but sleeping. Look at this. They ridiculed him. 
knowing that she was dead. It's like, don't, don't tell us, don't tell us what you're going to do, Jesus. We know the truth. She's dead. He's like, well, you ain't going to see what I'm going to do. Just stay out of the room. Mom, dad, you guys come with me. He puts them all outside, verse 54. He took her by the hand and he called saying, little girl, arise. Literally, little lamb. So tender. Little lamb, arise. And then her spirit returned. And she arose immediately, and he commanded that she be given something to eat. And it said, I love verse 56. Her parents were astonished, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Mark's gospel says, instead of astonished, it says they were overcome with great amazement. And, and, and here's the picture. They, they were just like out of their minds crazy happy. I've seen kind of what this looks like. When I was a paramedic, we, you know, we used to roll up and, and you know, we'd have people that overdose on, on narcotics and we'd give them Narcan. It's a, it's a medicine that reverses the effects of Narcan. And it's pretty miraculous when you watch Narcan work. Like the guy's laying there for all intents and purposes dead and then you put Narcan in and they wake up. And we, we had one, one day, we rolled up to this guy's house. He's in Paris. He's a young kid. And he's got like 15 family members and they are collectively losing their minds and we get there, and we push the Narcan, and my partner decides he's going to, you know, make a show of it. So after we push the Narcan, he puts his hand on the guy's forehead, and he says, rise and be healed. And right on cue, this kid starts waking up, and the family loses their mind. It's a miracle! It's a miracle! It's a miracle of medical science, not an actual miracle. This is a bona fide miracle, and they're losing their minds. Such an incredible thing. What we see here is faith exalted, right? Faith exalted. This is, this is triumph. Angels are singing. Thank you, Lord, for, for healing my baby. But listen, here's the question as we close. What about those times that Jesus does not raise? What about those times when Jesus doesn't heal? When, what about when the outcome is bad? What about when the cancer isn't healed? What about when it's terminal? What about when tragedy strikes? And I would answer that question this way. What if Jairus knew ahead of time what Jesus was going to do? I think that would change maybe what was going on in his life. I mean, he comes to the Lord begging him to heal, to heal his daughter and all. And that's an awesome thing. Text doesn't say it, and it's taken liberties with the text, but we can, you know, make a guess that he, that he was getting a little uptight when Jesus was delayed. But what if, G, what if Jairus knew, hey, you know what? It's all cool, man. Jesus is going to heal. He's going to heal her. He's going to deliver her. See, it would have changed the equation completely. What if we knew a week in advance? What if he knew years in advance? Listen, here's why I ask that question. As Christians, we do know. See, listen, if you have been saved by the Lord, not only does he promise you that, that you're cleansed of your sins and forgiven and going to be cleansed from all unrighteousness and that he's going to do a sanctifying, or not only a saving work, but a sanctifying work. He's going to make you more and more like Christ. But there's also a future work. There, there, there's a work of glorification that's going to happen in your life to where when we go to heaven, we're going to receive a new body and we're going to have eternal life with the Lord See, Paul told the Corinthians this. He said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal must put on immortality. And so when this corruption, when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? What Paul is saying is this, listen, you're going to be resurrected. You're going to be changed and and and. The, the, the wonder of knowing Jesus as Lord and Savior is that you have a future and a hope and you have life after the grave. See, listen, Job said this. He said, for I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth and after my skin is destroyed, 
this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. See, Job touches on something critically important here. Look, you're going to die. We all will. This girl, miraculously raised from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. But, you know, she would go, she'd ultimately die. Everybody that Jesus, Jesus heals, everybody that he saves, ultimately, the Bible says it's appointed unto man once to die and then to face judgment. And so we're all, you're like, bummer, Ted, gee whiz. Such a great message, and you got to bum me out. No, 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 this is hope. This is hope, because whether or not God gives us a miraculous healing or not, if we trust Christ as our Lord and Savior, we have a future and a hope. There's life beyond the grave. You will live for eternity. The question, my friends, is where are you going to live for eternity? Where are you going to live eternally? We confess Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Hey, he gives us life today, and he gives us life everlasting in the world to come. Thank you.